Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be in the world. My name is David Horrigan, and this is the law.mit.edu podcast with Dazzle Greenwood and me. The law.mit.edu is a podcast that explores the rapidly changing worlds of law and technology. As our, our lives become increasingly more digitized, it's important, more important than ever, to start thinking about reimagining and re-engineering the law and how it interacts with technology. Each episode, we're joined by thought leaders from around the world in order to demystify and break down the complex topics at the intersection of law and technology and help you better tackle the topics. Now, of course, a gentleman who needs no introduction, our partner here at the law.mit.edu is in fact the executive director, our good friend, Daza Greenwood. Daza, what's up for today and what's our topic? Oh, thank you so much, David. Um, and you know, the, the topic today is one uh, near and dear to my heart, and actually that has captured the focus of, of the entire law.mit.edu research team and also our publication, MIT Computational Law Report, and that is none other than generative AI for law. And we're going to do a deep dive into one of the key implications of what does it mean to successfully use this technology when you're practicing law. But you know, I don't want any spoilers yet at this point. We're just introducing ourselves. And so that's who I am. That's what I'm doing here. And Dave, take thank us to the next step. All right. Thank you, Daza. And to say that we have a consummate expert with us today on this subject would be a drastic understatement. Our guest today is Olga Mack. Many of you in the world of legal technology know Olga. Olga V. Mack is a vice president at LexisNexis, where she serves as vice president and CEO of CouncilLink CLM, formerly known as ParleyPro. Uh, Olga was the CEO of ParleyPro, a contract lifecycle management platform, which was acquired by LexisNexis in 2022. And here's where we get into a true Renaissance legal technologist. In addition to her work uh, bringing technology to legal teams, Olga is an accomplished attorney, having served as commissioner on the California Law Revision Commission and as the general counsel of the SAS firm ClearSide, uh, as well as the general counsel of the Pacific Art League, counsel at Visa, and uh, counsel at ZUSC. And we'll get more into that later in the broadcast because we'll find some interesting connections to the world of legal technology. Uh, earlier in her career, she worked in big law at Wilson Sonsini, and if that weren't enough, she's a former assistant district attorney in San Francisco. Olga Mack, welcome to the law.mit.edu podcast. Well, hello, everyone, David. Good to see you. Daza, I love that jacket. Uh, amazing. You didn't have to dress for me, but look amazing. I'm really excited about this conversation, everyone. And we are too, and uh, we're just disappointed that we cannot share uh, Daza's vibrant jacket with all of you because this is podcast land. But let us just say that Daza is looking terrific and very spiffy today. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Ken. Hi, Daza. It is bright pink. It, it is beautiful. It's it's a shade of pink for, for the listeners. And uh, uh, Daza in, a, in, in the jacket, shade of pink is a beautiful sight. No doubt about that. All right, we're gonna start off today's broadcast with a little bit of a quiz. And um, I'm going to ask Olga and Daza if they have heard or have any familiarity with this, with this, some of these cases. We've got Shaboon v. Egypt Air, a 2013 decision out of the first, dist uh, first appellate district in Illinois. We've got Peterson v. Iran Air from the District of the District of Columbia, a federal decision from 2012. Uh, Martinez v. Delta Airlines. We're getting a theme here of uh, something in the air. It's a Texas appellate decision from 2019. A state of Durden v. KLM Royal Dutch Airlines, a Georgia state court case from 2017, or perhaps Ehrlich v. American Airlines uh, from the appellate division in New Jersey, 2003. Um, anything ring a bell? These cases seem familiar to you at all? Have you yeah. ever seen them in a law book, perhaps? Wow, yeah, I think I these are these are like my, the dream cases that I most want to cite in a brief. Wow, and a dream so like a hallucination, dreamy. perhaps? Yeah, it's exactly <laughs> like a, these are the fake <laughs> cases that uh, ChatGPT uh, shoveled to the that lawyer that got in trouble in New York, right? 
Uh, Daza gets this one. You are correct, sir. These are the fake citations from Mata v. Avianca, Inc. And um, we're going to get Olga's expert opinion on some of the things that come up in this case. One of the big things is supervision. And I think a lot of you have heard about this case, but we'll just give you some brief background. Uh, Mr. Mata was uh, traveling on an Avianca Air flight um, from El Salvador to JFK. And, uh, you know, I'm six foot four, we have had a lot of tall people. And sometimes if you're really tall, you're cramped in that seat, your leg may be in the aisle. Well, the drink cart comes down the aisle and allegedly, once again, facts are not decided yet, but allegedly the drink cart comes and smacks uh, Mr. Mata in the leg, um, litigation ensues. And so um, his lawyers were getting ready for a filing and I believe it was on a statute of limitations issue. So um, they file some cases with the court and the court is thinking something seems odd here. And yeah, specifically, it was one of the 11th Circuit citations that tripped him up. And so the court actually called down to the 11th Circuit and was like, hey, have you ever heard of this case? And they're like, uh, no. <laughs> well, you know where this goes. Um, one of the attorneys had actually just asked chat GPT for some legal citations and chat GPT spat them all out and they were all fake. Uh, there were sanctions involved in this case. Um, and the, the supervision issue is on this. The case was originally a state court case. It was removed to federal court and the attorney signing and giving the affirmation on the ones was not the one doing the legal research. He was the one who was admitted to practice in the Southern District of New York in federal court. So his um, legal colleague was the one who was doing the uh, research with our good robot friend, ChatGPT, and uh, never bothered to check him, thinking, well, if it's ChatGPT, it must be correct. So Olga Mack, we've got um, issues of generative AI. We've got uh, issues of the supervision of attorneys. Uh, we think about uh, our model rules of professional conduct, rule 5.1 on the responsibilities of a partner, a supervisory lawyer, rule 5.2 responsibilities of a subordinate lawyer. But uh, so we've got, as I so Wait, often don't, say- don't, a, leave rule, don't forget rule 11. Oh yes, Daza. I would be negligent on that one. So we've got we've got all these issues plus generative AI thrown on top. Um, what's your first takeaway, Olga? Wow. <laughs> first takeaway, there's a lot of takes away. Um, look, as we know, hallucinations is a real problem with generative AI uh, or just hallucinations generally. Uh, this technology is designed to, to please us. And sometimes what pleases us is doesn't exist in the world. You know, uh, if you ever been married, had a relationship with anyone, you know, a good, well-intended compliment that may not necessarily correspond to reality improves marriage um, <laughs> or any relationship for that matter. And, and chat GPT, pleases us, it, it knows we're looking for something, it really wants to give it to us. And then it does. Who cares that it doesn't exist? Wait, the court cares. <laughs> the court actually cares that it does exist. And that's inconvenient. Um, so my first reaction is we either need to solve the hallucination problem or we really need to fix our courts because they just raining on our parades when we hear what we wanna hear. I mean, jokes aside, I mean, listen, any, anytime you, you, you do anything as a lawyer, it is your job to make sure that the stuff is good. When you do a filing in court, you put your signature on it, whether it's because you appear or some, you appear on somebody else's behalf, you are the holder of your license. That means you need to be comfortable in whatever representations are made, whether they're factual, or actually law representations. In this case, clearly, if all this case law doesn't exist, it only exists because it pleases you, that's while well, satisfying on some level, not satisfying to the court. Um, and so, yeah, so many failures of confidence, supervision, all kinds of things. Um, and that just means really, in the end of the day, low technology competence. <laughs> which leads to, you know, malpractice essentially uh, and inappropriate use of your license and putting your 
economic ability to earn living by practicing law, you know, um, a jeopardy. Sure. Olga, um, you know legal tech uh, as well as anyone. You were a 2020 Fast Case 50 Award winner. Um, you received the Women of Legal Tech in 2022 from the American Bar Association. You know this stuff. And it's often been said that technology can be the great equalizer for legal teams, allowing the small firms to compete with the big ones. You have been a general counsel for smaller organizations. You've also practiced in big law. What do you think? Uh, we have a firm that got into trouble on this one, but do you feel that technology, and let's go a step further, say generative, gen generative AI can, be, can level the playing field from the small firms and the big firms? Look, I think technology is an opportunity for us to redesign what we find unsatisfying with the world today. I think technology gives us a a restart, um, just kind of like what you have with a computer. Every time it does wonky things, you push, uh, you, you basically restart it. I think that's what technology allows us to do. There's a lot of things that are unfair, unjust, um, you know, including the fact that, you know, smaller players don't always have an opportunity to have an impact. For example, smaller law firms. And I absolutely agree that something like generative AI technology can give unrepresented player or smaller player or newcomer a, a seat at the table, you know, a shot in the game. Um, with that comes also an implicit understanding that you need to understand the thing that helps you. <laughs> Uh, sure. you know, with that right comes a massive responsibility uh, because technology, and I, 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 I feel like I say it all the time now, is a sharp knife. Um, it, is, it could be used to cure and it could be used to kill. And the difference is going to be that Delta is going to be a knowledgeable operator. A person or, or a collection of people are more likely to do good with a sharp tool if they are trained operators who have an analytical framework of getting from point A to point B, have a definition of success, um, and who possibly have done it before. Um, and if you have none of that, then you are lost. And you may be misusing the tool, you may be in danger to yourself, in danger to others, and you can be with this tool in danger to society at large. Because this, this tool actually allows you to mislead, for example, at scale. And that could be very damaging. That's why this tool specifically, generative AI, could solve a lot of things, but could also be that, that knife that kills. Hmm. Great, great analogy. As um, unfortunate as the end result may be, let's take it a step further. And Daza, it'd be great to get you in on this as well. Um, a lot has been said about the invasion of the robots. We've talked about the level of the playing field, but um, and we we talked about maybe it can level the playing field. But is there really the concern that it's going to take people's jobs? We have the strike right now going on with the writers and the actors in Hollywood. We have a lot of people in the legal community concerned about, boy, is this going to take all our jobs? Do you think, uh, both of you, do you think it's more of a tool to help? Or do you think there's a legitimate concern that we're all going to be working for the robots pretty soon or not have any jobs? Wow. Um, I, well, I, I did want to pop in um, on that and also to maybe um, deepen the question a little bit for, for Olga. Um, but to me, just the, the framing are around the, the MATA case um, I think is so intriguing because, and the reason I mentioned Rule Eleven is the 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 fundamental um, obligation is to practice law competently, which means you know checking sites, um, ensuring that the legal arguments are in the best interests of of your client, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you know, and Rule Eleven um, codifies that obligation for filings uh, or, or representations to a court. You know that among other things that you you you've done your job, you've got some due diligence. 
you have an evidentiary basis for the assertions that you're making in the first instance. Um, but I, I think this is so fascinating precisely because, um, precisely be, well, so just on that one, I'll stick on that for one second, and then I want to really talk about supervision primarily. But to me, that seems like that's another way of saying there's a, there's a critical role for a human with respect to the use of generative AI, which is competently, expertly, diligently reviewing, assessing, evaluating, you know, critiquing and correcting or outright rejecting the outputs of generative AI. That, that is the essence of practicing law. Um, and it's, it's so interesting because of the duty of supervision, I feel like plays out in multiple ways here um, it, it, in terms of like the uh, lawyer job um, preservation, um, like act of 2024 and beyond. Um, it's like not, it seems like it's not merely supervising, or I guess it's a question, is it just supervising people who are using generative AI or does the duty of supervision is have its own valence with respect to supervising the tool and the process itself. So I, I guess I'd love to to learn more about that. But all of this, whoever's doing the due diligence and the law practice, whoever's doing the supervision, these are all human beings. And so I do feel like we're not replacing humans. We're we're supercharging humans with the technology, and we're um, further honing and applying our duties in light of the technology. But that raises these open questions. It's new technology. How do we apply them? And like, and I'd love to dig much more deeply into into the, this human role of supervision and how that plays out in the in all the various ways that this technology is going to be used. What do you think, Olga? <laughs> you know, look, duty of supervision. I mean, I've done recently quite a lot of research and thinking about it. A couple of things, it's, it's not unique to lawyers, first of all. Other professions have it either codified or as a matter of practice. That's observation number one. Observation number two, it is also not unique to United States lawyers. It pretty much one way or another exists in most democracies and most places where you see lawyers. Um, so it's a pretty universal duty, really, one way or another. And then observation three, what I find is that what it means is actually a point in time question. Um, it started sort of with this sort of traditional apprenticeship model, which, which used to exist in every part of human society, from artists to lawyers, to publishers, to whatever. Um, it, it sort of started with, it, it, today, it includes things like ensuring work quality, promoting ethical conduct, providing training, uh, managing cases, maintaining client community, that includes all kinds of stuff. But it changed over time. It changed over time from something, you watch me do it and then you can do the same, to something more like, let me show you best practices. Here's how to deal with privacy issues and ethical concerns. And I think where it is evolving into something much more comprehensive, that includes things like supervising technology. We're moving away from supervision, meaning you train to be a lawyer, because we now have law schools, really, and we have um, bar exams that kind of like takes care of a lot of this like early apprenticeship stuff. Now it's sort of in the beginning of your career just to make sure that you like don't get, you know, you don't sink in the pool completely. But it evolved into something more of sort of helping you coach you through career, doing the right thing, and thinking through ethics, and then not just a lawyer who is who who just graduated from from law school, but also may include vendors because their results could be input in your filings, and you are certifying that you supervise them, for example. So it evolved into much more than apprenticeship model to much more comprehensive sort of general duty of supervision of all kinds of stuff. And I think where this is all going is that supervising technology too, and we've been basically certifying with e-discovery, for example, 
it's already been there, but now we have what, you know, what David described as Rob, robots is here and we may be working for them. I'm not sure if this is where we're going. Robots will still be working for us for quite a while and it will be our duty according to model rules to supervise them. I'm pretty sure that is not a stretch of, of the rules we have today. And I think other professions will be supervising and codifying or at least developing best practices about how to do it. I'm gonna stop here because I can talk about it all day. <laughs> but in a nutshell, that those are the sort of three trends that I see. That's great. Um, by the way, um, we may not be working for the robots because if the recent congressional testimony means anything, we may be working for the Martians soon. Um, if you've <laughs> heard about that, and this is not some inebriated guy on in a Cessna. These are long-term United States military officers testifying that, uh, yeah, you know, there was biological material. They brought them in. So, um, we may have bigger things to worry about than the generative AI robots. But it does, uh, it was great that you brought up Rule 11 um, because the court, of course, cites Rule 11 in Mata Via Bianca and uh, specifically Rule 11C1, um, providing that absent exceptional circumstances, a law firm must be held jointly responsible for a law, for a violation committed by its associates or employees. And we talked about the Model Rules of Professional Conduct 5.1 and 5.2, um, and 5.1 is basically, I'm going to paraphrase it, but it's basically saying, hey, partner supervisory lawyers, you're responsible for um, what your lawyers do. And then 5.2 goes on from there saying that, um, you know, um, the subordinate lawyers, just because your boss told you to do an illegal thing doesn't mean you're off the hook. You've got to follow the rules instead of that. So when you're thinking about the rules and thinking about this situation, do you think that lawyers think about what they could do with generative AI? I, I have to admit, if I were the supervisory attorney in this case, even though the world changed a lot on November 30th, the last year, when uh, generative AI really hit the uh, hit, hit the whole nation, the world, et cetera, um, is it reasonable to think that someone may have gone and checked that? I wouldn't have thought, gee, I need to ask him, did he use generative AI to do this? Is it now? I mean, a lot of people have heard of it, but uh, how does AI change the rules of the ball game here? Do we need to now add it into the federal rules of civil procedure that there are rules on using chat GPT for evidence? I mean, at the White House recently, some of the leading tech CEOs gathered with the president to talk about voluntary guidelines. Do we need to put generative AI into the rules? Olga, what do you think? As, as a technologist who's been in SaaS, data, AI, ML, blockchain, crypto, and numerous other disruptive technologies before they were cool and earned their buzz, I know the knee-jerk reaction is to regulate technology, but really laws regulate behaviors. And sometimes when it's hard to regulate behaviors, they, they kind of focus on impact and outcomes. That's sort of our standard way to, to write laws. I kind of think we should stick to that. Um, I think it works, generally speaking. Um, I think the rule of supervision is there. It is clear enough. It has extended over time, as I just talked about, I don't think it's a massive stretch to extend it to supervision of machines, whatever shape, form they come into our lives. Uh, what's, that is not to say that we're all great, ready to go. I think there are pieces missing. Here's the pieces that are missing. What's missing is the how. What's missing is the analytical structure. What's missing with definition of success. That's what's missing. And I can kind of maybe talk a little bit in greater depth about it. The rule is pretty simple and definitely applies to human. I guarantee you, if you survey 20, 100, 2,000 lawyers or professionals, I'm going to pick on lawyers, professionals, 
they will have different approaches to supervision, different definitions of success, and different ways they deal with shortcomings of their supervi individual supervising models. We do oh not, God. let me finish, we do not teach what students what it means to be a good supervisor. I, I had once been assigned a gentleman to be my mentor. After he ignored me for about three months, we ended up in the same elevator. This gentleman happened to be always very well dressed. And as we were going down in the elevator, this gentleman was a lawyer. From a 30th floor to the first, we had a brief exchange where he said, oh, I realize I need to be your mentor. And let me give you practical advice. When you travel, make sure you bring an extra suit because sometimes you spill stuff all over yourself and you need to change. I'm sure he meant well, and this advice sounds solid. And in his mind, he checked the box of mentoring me. I can tell you as a junior lawyer, I got off that elevator confused. Confused whether he thinks my suit was not up to par, whether he thinks I'm a slob because I'm likely to spill stuff all over myself, whether he thinks I don't know how to pack. Uh, and generally felt that the excitement about this senior lawyer mentoring me would extend to something more exciting like how I practice law. Uh, but in his mind, this was very practical and useful and he meant well. And I think we're both right. We just operate from a different intellectual space of what it means to be a supervisor and a mentor and what's helpful to a junior lawyer. And I think it's just an extreme example, right? But if you know, people do not have a shared definition of success of supervision, they have no analytical framework of what it means to, how to do it. And they absolutely don't have a way to measure whether they're doing a good job. That's with people. That's before we get to machines. Now, when you add AI on top of the fact that we already don't know what we're doing, then it's hard. The problem is not the law, it's operationalizing the next steps, envisioning success and measuring results. Mm. Yeah, you know, with um, I do a lot of mentoring um, as part of the role at, at MIT with the uh, younger students. And um, it's so important to tune the mentoring to, to the mentee, to the person you're talking to and to really understand them. Uh, I'm sorry that happened to you. It reminds me a little bit of um, when I was a very young lawyer, um, I got kind of thrown in the deep end very quickly in a state government and uh, with respect to technology and I ended up testifying the first time I testified in Congress. Um, I was young, like in my 20s and I um, had my suit, I kind of flew down to DC, like clockwork, dumped a bunch of horrible things over breakfast on my suit, I couldn't wear the jacket. Um, I did have an extra shirt, um, which I put on, and then the staff wouldn't allow me to get onto the, the Senate committee um, room not wearing a jacket. I had a tie, but they're like, you can't do it. I, I think it's relaxed. So they ended up finding a jacket for me that was like, I don't know, five sizes too small. It looked like one of those monkeys with the crank or something. It was horrible. But, you know, um, in my case, as someone who apparently was a slob, like that actually could have been good advice to me, but you have to tune the advice to the person. It has to be meaningful. You can't just check a box. And, and you're right, we have so far to go with, with what does it mean to mentor? What does supervision mean? Um, how do we make it effective? How can we rely upon it when so many people don't know what it is, how to measure it, or how to do it? It's, it's a whole new horizon. And that's, that's with humans. Right, and with humans, you can, you know, at least if you your EQ is a little higher, you can say, "Hey, Daza, tell me where you're in life. You know, tell me what your biggest challenge is. How can I be helpful?" Like that's easily solved. And I, I do think this gentleman meant well. Clearly, it would be helpful in some circumstances. 
And but with machine, you really need to have an approach. You need to have a definition of success, and you need to be able to deal with setbacks. And yeah. today, we basically telling lawyers you have you have a rule, you have a duty. Go do it. Do a good job. If you fail. You may be disbarred and your economic right to make a living as a lawyer that you work so hard may be lost. Good luck. May the odds be in your favor. Right. <laughs> what, which brings us up to what you said in, in, the, in the end of your, your statement is what's missing is how. We have the rules. The rules are pretty well adapted, are, are, are capable of being applied to different circumstances and new technologies. But we're not born knowing this stuff. The technology is new. And I feel like I'd be... Um, remiss if I didn't mention that Olga is also an esteemed member of the law.mit.edu task force on the use of generative AI for law practice, and uh, which has recently published um, principles and guidelines to hope, we hope, help to begin to put meat on the bones for how to apply our existing rules of professional uh, responsibility to the use of generative AI. And one of those rules is, I think the principle seven is supervision. Um, and we, but we're just scratching the 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 tip of the iceberg here uh, in terms of how to do it. And really, there are going to need to be rubrics and practices and you know examples that are here's a good example of how to do it. Here's a bad example of how to do it. Like we've got a th there's a big open space there, and half of using generative AI is getting the prompt right. The other half, or maybe 60, 70, 80, 90 percent, is is evaluating properly the outputs bef before working it in and that that really is the essence of the supervision isn't it that rule needs to be operationalized that's that's business fee we mm -hmm. need to take the rule and create a framework and then based on that through examples and checklists allow folks to do a good job and measure success and have a shared definition of success um, and we, we, that, that's a standard operational procedure in any complex task and make no mistake, supervising anything or anyone is a complex task. It requires a framework, it requires a checklist and it requires a vision of success. And so I think that's the part where the void needs to be filled. And to answer David's original question, I, don't, I think we have enough laws in the book that doing the right thing um, not committing fraud, um, not lying, stealing, cheating, like the basic things that law is really just sort of encouraging what I call civil society, what people call civil society and good behaviors. We have enough of that on the books. You don't have to regulate technology, you regulate behaviors. You can extend much of what we already have to any technology. What's missing is analytical framework sometimes. This is where um, like trade organizations like ABA could be helpful or um, maybe regulatory agencies could be helpful or professionals getting together could be helpful and sort of development of examples, scenarios, uh, best practices, checklists. Checklists are key. Those things need to be happening with supervision for humans or machines. We've got a real theme going on today of do your homework and how supervision comes in different ways. You know, you were telling stories from way back when, when I was much younger, we were working on a case and we were in voir dire and doing the jury selection. And um, we got back and we're in the room conferring. One of the prospective jurors had worked with opposing counsel. And so I'm the young guy there and I pipe up, well, we've got to strike her. They used to work together. And the senior partner goes, nope we are not going to waste a strike on her. And he could see I had this quizzical look on my face. And he goes, that guy is a bleep. That's not what he said. Um, he said, if she worked with him, she's got to hate him. They'll strike him. We're not going to, they'll strike her. We're not going to waste a strike. Sure enough, that's exactly what they did. And it saved us a strike. And so I was the young kid who didn't know any of that stuff but it equates to what we're talking about and supervision comes in many, many ways and it's knowing the people and sometimes generative AI is not gonna know the people and know the case law. But on this deal about different ways of supervising, 
Olga, you are the quintessential American lawyer. You're a graduate of the University of California Berkeley School of Law, member of the California Bar. You've worked for major American law firms. But in your work as a general counsel here in the United States, you've also had big international experience. Some of these are international companies doing international business. And in fact, um, you emigrated here from Ukraine at a very young age. So you are not having tunnel vision in the US. When you think about this supervision, do you find that it differs in different parts of the world? Yeah, so I've done a lot of research and I definitely, as, as somebody who was born elsewhere and English is my second language and I, I travel quite a lot and have been in companies with massive footprints of the United States, uh, I, I, I have a sort of much sort of, to this rule of law concept, I have a much sort of worldly presence uh, what I do find is that the duty of supervision is actually pretty universal, definitely across uh, democracies um, and where you see high concentration of lawyers, which is like Asia, EU, Brazil, places like that. Uh, you definitely have some sort of codified way uh, of duty of supervisions. Uh, they all emphasize uh, competence as a critical aspect of supervision. Um, they emphasize uh, supervisory responsibilities such as work quality, ethical conduct, uh, oversight. All of that is sort of universally recognized. Um, client service and acting in client's best interest, those are really common themes. Um, there is sort of a very, very degree of specificity and details, and there's definitely enough differences. But but I would say to me, overwhelmingly, those things are, are have a lot in common. Um, they uh, some of the countries include sort of the themes around business management, others don't, uh, and some have sort of more specific. Uh, guidelines and some have sort of more regional like EU. If you practicing, if you, there, you know, if you as a member country in the United States, in the in the European Union, you may belong to the uh, equivalent of the bar there, but you also may be a EU, EU lawyer as well. So you may have overlapping duties of supervision. So I, I would say. It's close enough in most jurisdictions. There are differences in, in specialist specificity, but it is definitely there. It is common themes. And I would go as far as saying that they more or less evolve over time and lock steps. So sort of expectations of, of, of broadening that duty to include vendors, to include ethics, to include technology, all of that I think is very much uh, rising around the same level across regions. Olga, one thing that we like to do on the law.mit.edu podcast is get to know our guests. Now, we've um, known you professionally for many years, but uh, our audience may not be familiar with some parts of your career journey. And one of the things that we found interesting was your work as an assistant general counsel at Zeusk. And for those of you who may not be familiar with it, it is an online dating service operating in 80 nations all over the world, um, 25 different languages. Um, it seems to be a great collection of many of the issues. You've got online, you've got data, you, I assume, have personal information. What was it like being the lawyer for the online dating service? <laughs> I joke that I should have retired after working at Zeus. Because I think I peak as an interesting person then. I can tell you when I would show up to parties and declare that I'm a lawyer, I was a number two lawyer, I was a, a, a associate general counsel there, um, that I'm a lawyer for a lighting dating company. Most people in the room, I would, I would say all, but that's probably an overstatement, would find me fascinating and interesting. They would come to me and ask me about advice and, um, and what it's like and things I'm willing to share and things I'm not willing to. I, I was like literally the most interesting person in the room. I can tell you that joining a SaaS company was a, was a massive downgrade and, legal, <laughs> and a legal tag did not improve my odds. 
Um, and and so uh, it was a really, really fascinating um, place to work because it's really something, you know, I find that love is a relatable thing to, to everyone. We all, one way or another, had an adventure in love, whether it's, it's you know, a successful adventure or the one that taught us a lesson or the one that uh, uh, allowed us to grow, whatever that thing was, we all felt it deeply and strongly. And so uh, finding a lawyer who, who helps people fall in love is a deeply fascinating thing. Um, that particular company was very interesting for many reasons. It's definitely not the one and only company today, but at the time it was one of the first online dating companies on the internet. So, so we're talking about early days of internet and the two founders and the, and the staff they hired um, were innovators, truly innovators. And yes, love, <laughs> but let's break down love into, into something more scientific and make it completely uninteresting. Um, let's talk about data because online dating companies is a consumer facing business and online dating company operates across geography. And for online dating company to be successful, you have to basically rely on data one way or another for at least two things. One, uh, marketing, because that's how you acquire users. And two, product development, because you need to figure out you know, what makes people fall in love and be interested and go on the first day and ultimately you know, figure out a way to make that relationship successful. So, you know, behind the heart, there is data. And to me, that business, if you take all these sort of jokes aside, was very interesting because I, I see uh, any online dating company or including Zeus as essentially a data company. We had a lot of data scientists on the team. I was, I was advising uh, various uses of data at the time where, um, CCPA was developing and GDPR was in its infancy. And it's actually not all that different from the time we have today with AI. The, when you have uh, a void in laws and practices, best practices, um, you see, you have a delta between law and you have a delta between law and the right thing to do. And depending who you talk to, that delta could be big or small. And your job as in-house lawyer or risk professional, any kind, is really to have sophisticated conversations about that. Because what you know for sure is that the void will be filled with an increasing number of regulations. And that may take three, five, 10 years, depending on industry. And at some point, you will be judged inside 2020. And so you can take an opportunistic view and say, in the absence of anything, let's, let's do the minimal, let's do the floor because there's a void. Or you can be an enlightened leader. You really are faced with that choice. You can, you can talk about the ceiling. You can talk about what is the right thing to do what kind of world you and your children should be living in. If somebody handled data like this for you, how would you want them to behave? Would that look good um, on the internet or newspaper? Uh, all of those conversations and really kind of figure out what the Delta is and whether how close to the ceiling or floor, what is the consciousness of your organization? And I really enjoyed that job. Uh, because for that reason, in the context of a dating company, not only is it a data company, it's a data company that collects a lot of information. And we're not just talking about names, like cards, numbers, locations. We're talking about intimate things that you may not even share with people in your life that are your close to, like your parents. Like, for example, it's not unusual for online dating company to collect whether you have STDs, your sexual orientation, all kinds of stuff that not on your LinkedIn, 
that your parents may or may not know. Hey, your spouse may or may not know. Uh, all kinds of stuff that is very just, just private. Um, and so it was really interesting for me as I consider myself a privacy professional. Um, to me, that's being part of technology lawyer and um, thinking through the issues of doing the right thing through the ethics of it um, was very interesting. And we are facing exactly the same challenges today with AI. While we do have enough laws in the books, um, things like ethical considerations, thinking about uh, impact of what you're developing in AI, those are not codified just yet. Um, and so many companies developing AI today are forced to think about what is the right thing to do, which I think, you know, David mentioning that OpenAI and other players went to Congress and asking for it. That's one approach to do it. But also you can engage in that exercise with competent counsel. And I guarantee you, you may not get everything exactly right that's gonna happen in the future, but I guarantee you that if you get technologists, lawyers, business professionals in the room who are competent and who have consciousness, and want to build a good world, I guarantee you, you will end up with really good outcome. Maybe not exactly right, but pretty close. A call for lawyers with a conscience, as well as experience on the much more entertaining world of being a lawyer to help people fall in love. Olga V. Mack, Vice President and CEO of CounselLink CLM, Renaissance lawyer, former law enforcement official, former uh, uh, general counsel of a couple of firms. It has been a real pleasure having you here today. And thank you for your insights on generative AI. And as this thing uh, concludes, I hope you'll come back and join us. And Daza, as usual, would you like to close us out? I would love to. And I want to second that. Thank you so much for, for sharing your time so generously and your insights and admonitions, Olga. And um, you know, it's, it's, this is what makes, uh, David and I and law.mit.edu want to do the podcast, this kind of substantive and I'd say entertaining programming. And so, uh, we hope that you will join us again for our next episode of this podcast. And until then, we look forward to seeing you at law.mit.edu. Mm -hmm.